alive. Good evening, everyone. Good to have you with us. We're kind of lopsided. Uh, I know that as the camera looks this way, it's like backwards. So there's really it's more gone. people on this side than that side. Oh, but, uh, I was thinking. Um, no, it's it's fine. Lopsided meaning we have more people sitting one way or the other. Hopefully, you no know, deer will show up in the background, and I'll make some kind of comment about that. Uh, announcements, of course. Uh, this Sunday is Father's Day, and uh, I think my daughter put it on Facebook, and I maybe mentioned this quite some time ago. Uh, right after Mother's Day, uh, someone said, watch, churches will be closed on Mother's Day, but it'll be open for Father's Day. And we're not even, not, not only open, we're going to have a feast on top of it. So if, if there's any consolation, and I'm saying this to have you guys help me remember, uh, the food pantry gave me a bucket full of flowers in little, I mean, they're just like, they're in the fridge ready to be taken. So, you know, that's my makeup to the ladies for not being here. Uh, but they aren't going to do any good in the refrigerator. So please uh, bring some hope. They're not the plantable kind. They're the go Stamps. home, put them in a vase and put water in them and that kind of thing. Uh, take your Bibles again. We're going to turn to... Exodus chapter 32, also on Sunday, uh, just a reminder, we're going to have a combined Sunday school. I uh, gave Naomi the Sunday off, told her to stay home to be with her dad on Father's Day. Uh, so we're going to have a combined Sunday school with the children, uh, and an appropriate uh, topic for them. Uh, tonight is going to be a little, a little deep, maybe. Uh, my apologies, we're, we're looking at uh, Exodus chapter 32 and verses 7 through 14 and we've been in this portion, this is now the fourth Wednesday that we've been looking at just verses 7 through 14 and we've kind of been going through them uh, sequentially but I want to read starting with verse 7 through 14, Exodus 32 Verse 7, And the Lord said unto Moses, Go, get thee down, for thy people, which thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made them a molten calf, and have worshipped it, and have sacrificed thereunto, and said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which have brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said unto Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore let me alone, that my wrath may wax hot against them, that I may consume them, and I will make of thee, Moses, a great nation. And Moses besought the Lord his God, and said, Lord, why doth thy wrath wax hot against thy people, which thou hast brought forth out of the land of Egypt with great power? And with a mighty hand. Wherefore should the Egyptians speak and say, For mischief did he bring them out, to slay them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? And then notice his prayer turn, here's Moses telling God, turn from thy fierce wrath and repent of this evil against thy people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, in Israel thy servants, to whom thou swearest by thine own self, and saidest unto them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have spoken of will I give it, will I give unto your seed, and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto his people. I'm not going to take the time to review what we've looked at so far. But I mentioned last week as we closed that I was going to zero in tonight on verse number 14. The Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do. What, what happened here? God uh, seemingly changed his mind. And how do we uh, explain that? Moses said, turn from my wrath. And God repented from that wrath. He repented from the evil that he was going to do. So uh, I'm going to ask the Lord to to bless our time. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for those that you brought out tonight. Mm -hmm. uh, we thank you for uh, those that are listening online. And uh, Lord, we, uh, we thank you that you uh, give us your word to uh, 
learn not only about you, but about ourselves, about uh, our needs, and Lord, uh, your desire that we pray. And uh, Father, we certainly recognize that um, we are limited at times in our understanding, and even in understanding Scripture sometimes it's difficult. And so I just pray that uh, you would help me as I try to explain these things. And uh, Lord, we just thank you for your love. Thank you for your long suffering. Thank you for Moses being a mediator uh, for uh, your people in this case. And uh, just bless our time together, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, verse number 14, And the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto his people. A lot of times we hear the word repent, and we think of it in human terms that a person sinned against God or sinned against another person, and we need to repent. We need to uh, change our mind about that sin. We need to change direction. And, of course, to say God sinned and needed to change what he was doing was, no. Uh, God did not sin. Uh, certainly God cannot sin. Uh, there's different ways, if you were looking different translations, uh, not every version has the Lord repented. Uh, sometimes it'll use the word relent. Uh, other times it'll say God changed his mind. Other translations have reconsidered, turned from, prevailed upon, and appeased. So there's all these different ways uh, that it's stated other than just repent. But the bottom line is God said, I'm going to destroy these people. I'm going to start over with you, Moses. And then God changed his mind. And so how do, we, how do we reconcile that with this thought? Why does God, I, I, I mean, here's, here's a challenge. God says he's going to do something and then doesn't do it. Is like, wait a minute, that's not like God. God means what he says. God says what he means. You know, there are... There are parents, and I'm sure we were guilty at times, as were you. You know, you threaten, and you threaten, and you threaten, and then you count to three, and pretty soon the three is 33, and you're still threatening, and nothing, you know, God doesn't operate that way. And so how do we, how do we reconcile uh, that God says certain things about himself, like, let's look at one, uh, turn to Numbers, so you're in Exodus, turn to Numbers chapter 23. Numbers 23. And we're going to look at a, at a few of these. We have some declarative statements where God says, when I say something, I'm going to do it. When I say something, I mean it. Numbers 23, verse number 19. I'll give you a moment to get there. Uh, Numbers 23, verse 19. God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Right now you should be going, Err! he just said he repented of the evil that he spoke of, and now he's saying, God is not the son of man, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? When God says something, God follows through with that thing that he says. So how do we, in our minds, reconcile God relented, God changed his mind, God didn't do the evil that he said he was going to do, with this verse that says, God doesn't change his mind. God means what he says, says what he means, does what he says. Uh, Isaiah 46 Isaiah 46. And again, I just want to show you some declarative statements where God makes absolute statements and says, this is the way I am. This is who, who I am. This is the way I am describing myself. 
Isaiah 46, verse 10. And I, I have, I'll just say this, I have been enjoying these Wednesday nights. Uh, this, this one's a little bit tough. I'll just say that. This is a, uh, I, I didn't quite look forward to this as much just because it's a little bit uh, difficult and, and a little uh, harder to understand and certainly harder to explain. But Isaiah 46, verse 10, uh, or verse 9, remember the form of things of old, for I am God. There is none else. I am God, and there is none like me. So God is speaking, declaring the end from the beginning. God knows how things are going to turn out before they even start. He declares the end from the beginning um, and from ancient times, the things that are not yet done. Things that are still in the future, God knew from ancient times how they're going to turn out. Okay, the, the omniscience of God. Uh, saying, my counsel shall stand, I will do all my pleasure. What I say is going to happen. Uh, verse 11, calling a ravenous bird from the east, the man that executeth my counsel from a far country, yea, I have spoken it, I will also bring it to pass, I have purposed it, I will also do it. Again, plain statements of God saying, I am going to bring to pass what I have declared, what I have said. So again, we're trying to, what I'm trying to, help you like okay we seem to have a contradiction Exodus 32 God said something God didn't follow through with something we have these statements of God that says I am God is not a man that he should lie neither the son of man that he should repent hath he said it and shall he not do it hath he spoken shall he not make it good he declares that what he says he means he means what he says uh Declares the end from the beginning. Yes, dear. Could it have been because of Moses' intercessory prayer? Oh, it certainly was. It certainly was. And we're gonna we're gonna explain that more when we when we get there. But yes, definitely. Um, had he not interceded, just to jump ahead a little bit. Uh, well, we'll get to it. Um, <laughs> you, you don't need to turn there, but Malachi. 3 6 says, For I am the Lord, I change not. Uh, James 1 17, maybe you're familiar with this verse. Again, you don't need to turn there, but every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. God does not change, and yet God did change. So what happened? That's what we're going to try and uh, wrestle with. Here's some wrong ways to look at it. Number one, wrong approaches. God didn't mean it when he said, I'm going to destroy this people and start over with you. Okay? God didn't mean it. He was just kidding. All right? Well, I have a bigger problem with that than he changed his mind. I mean, Amen. to say God was just kidding and he really said something he didn't mean. Uh, if he said something he didn't mean, that makes him a liar, and that's not God, okay? So that's not the right approach to say God really didn't mean it. Uh, secondly, another wrong approach is that Moses brought up, and I kind of alluded to this last week, Moses brought up information that God had never considered. Moses brought up new things, and it was new information, and now God, with this new information, makes a different decision. Well, if new information was provided to God that enlightened God, then God is lacking, right? God is lacking in knowledge. God is lacking in wisdom. God is lacking in perfection because if God could be taught something or be, have something brought to his attention that he forgot, if he's forgetful or still needs to learn, then again, our picture of God is pretty small. All right, so cross that one off the list. Here's another one. Moses was more merciful than God. That's why God wanted to bring judgment and Moses wanted mercy because Moses was more merciful. Well, again, is there anyone really more merciful than God? And by the way, if you go through the rest of the chapter, you'll see that 
Moses gets down and Moses is angry. Twice it says his wrath waxes hot. Uh, so it wasn't that Moses was more merciful uh, than God and that Moses, you know, calmed God down. So we're, we're trying to reconcile how does, how does this work? All right, now, and again, I, I told you earlier that this, some of the stuff is a, a little bit uh, deeper or maybe make you scratch your head a little bit more. Uh, but here's what I want to present now is, is there are some rules in interpretation that we should keep in mind. When you come across, and I, th I think I've had conversations with some of you before, if, if there is a verse that seems to contradict another verse in the Bible, the problem is with our understanding of one of them. It's not contradictory. God does not contradict himself. The problem is our understanding, and if we understood it properly, the contradiction would go away. Okay, so we, we need to understand, but there are some that, even this instance, you know, God said he was going to do something, didn't do it, but over here, God says, I change not. I don't change my mind. I do what I say. I say. So there seems to be a contradiction. That's what I'm doing is, okay, let's work through this seeming contradiction. So one rule, and some of you, uh, I, I'm sure, would come up with these if I give you a moment to think about them. But one way to, one, one rule of interpretation is to compare Scripture with Scripture. I mean, that helps us. We compare different verses of life, like topic, and that helps us uh, clear things up sometimes. Uh, this one, again, this is probably, uh, okay, yeah, we, that makes sense, Pastor. Uh, clearer verses, the ones that, you know, the plain sense, make sense, seek no other sense, clearer verses should be used to explain the more difficult ones, right? Not vice versa. You don't take the difficult one that you can't understand to explain the plain one. You take the one that's easier to understand, less room for error when you, interpretation, and okay, then I have to make, this is what it is I need to make, I need to adjust my thinking on this verse based, uh, based on, this, uh, on this one. Um, here's one that might be a little confusing. Uh, keep in mind the, what theologians call the in literature, people actually call, keep in mind the, the genre or basically the type of literature, okay? You know in the Bible, there are letters. Letters to Timothy, letters to Colossians, letters to the Corinthians. There is poetry. We know that, right? There is history. There are the Gospels. There is prophecy. There are parables. And so you have to keep, when, when you go to interpret Scripture and understand what it means, you have to, in the back of your mind, you have to say, okay, well, when God declares something, straight out, makes a declaration, I am the Lord, I change not, that's different than how you look at a parable. A parable may have two or three central truths, but you can't, a sower went forth to sow, and he sowed his seed. Well, we know that if we want to witness to people, we don't cut up pieces of the Bible and scatter it around. You, you know, you, you don't, it's a parable. So there are certain parts of it that fit, and certain parts you understand are uh, symbolic or, or an allegory. And so you keep in the back of your mind, okay, what kind of reading am I doing right now? Uh, Exodus 32 is, and, and let's go back there for now. Uh, Exodus 32 is what we call narrative. It is not Paul writing theological truth. It is Moses. I hate to use the word story because story in my mind is something that's made up, but that's how people a lot of times will. Uh, narrative portions of scripture are the stories. They're historical account. And so we read, and, and we've spent some time on that. Moses went up in the mountain and he came down and he spoke, you know, the, God spoke the Ten Commandments to the people. So it's kind of a story that moves along uh, versus some of you have read through Chronicles. And when you read a hundred names in a row and they're all like I have names that don't even make any sense. You're like, ah, I can't wait to get this. You know, where's the nugget here? <laughs> um, 
whereas narratives are, you know, they flow along. The life of Joseph. and not, So we, we need to keep in mind that, that when Paul declares a theological truth, or God himself says, I am the Lord, I change not, that is a, you, you look at that differently than Moses writing about an experience that he had with God in human terms. You, you, you can't treat them both the same. And so you look at when God declares something, that is more binding, if you will, than trying to understand God in human terms. Okay, uh, and, and speaking of that, keep in mind, uh, turn to uh, 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles, I'll give you a minute to find that. 2 Chronicles. <clears throat> keep in mind the challenges of explaining God in human terms. Okay? Keep in mind the challenges there are of explaining God in human terms. Second Chronicles 16, verse 9. So you maybe uh, know this verse. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. We'll stop there. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth. Does God have eyes? No. No. God is a spirit being. God doesn't have eyes. But he sees everything at the same time. He's everywhere at the same time. So we have to try to use human words to explain God seeing everything all at the same time everywhere. And so we use a phrase like that. That's called a, uh, an anthrop, an anthropomorphism, where you ascribe to God man-like features. But God, there are verses that say God has eyes. Here's one, and God has ears. And yet, God in his being is a spirit, and he does not have eyes, and yet he sees everything. He does not have ears. He hears everything. Uh, so there are, and that's what I mean, there are challenges in trying to explain God using human terms. When that, that is also true when it comes to explaining the emotions of God and the feelings of God and the, and the thinking of God. We use our terms to try to explain the unexplainable, right? God, I mean, we can understand certain aspects of God. And some people are, you know, I've, I've said this a number of times, some people are bothered by they can't figure God out totally. And me, I'm like, that's a blessing to me. I'm glad I can't figure God out totally. That would make me equal with him. I want someone much greater than me, not someone my equal. If I could figure him out, I'd be his equal. And God is greater. God's ways are higher. And there's, so, so to describe how God's mind works and how God makes decisions, uh, how God feels, wrath wax hot, we have to use human words that we can understand. And that's difficult to explain God in his infiniteness and his complexity. It's difficult to explain God using uh, human words. Uh, one man wrote this about Exodus 32, verse 14. Uh, he, he wrote this, The meaning is not that God changed his mind, still less that he regretted something that he had intended to do. It means, in biblical language, that God now embarked on a different course of action from that already suggested as a possibility. He embarked on a different course of action. And Louise hit on that uh, last week. One more thing in interpreting, and then we're going to go to a, a Jeremiah 18. You can start turning there uh, if you want. But I, I want to make sure you're you're listening when I, I share this one last point. 
There is a difference between God giving a divine decree, this is the way it will be, versus a warning, if you do this, then this, if you do that, then that. There's a difference between those two. And sometimes we don't know which one it is until we look at the context. So Jeremiah 18 gives us a good example. And, and here's what I mean. An unconditional decree is, it is going to happen no matter what. A conditional warning is dependent on the response of the person. Jeremiah 18, look at verse 7. All right, let's go up to verse 5. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter, saith the Lord? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in mine hand, O house of Israel. And then he gives this warning. At one instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck up and to pull down and to destroy it. Now I have, I'm going to destroy a nation. I'm going to pluck it up. I'm going to pull it down. I'm going to destroy it. Verse 8, if that nation against whom I have pronounced turn from their evil, I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. God is giving here. He is not, I am going to pull them down, destroy them, no matter what. He's saying, if I'm, my, I'm going to, de I'm determining to do this, but if they repent and they turn from the evil, then I am not going to carry out that judgment. Uh, verse number eight, and concerning a kingdom, to build and to plant it, so I'm going to raise up a nation, I'm going to bless a nation, I'm going to be with a nation. If it, verse 10, do evil in my sight, that it obey not my voice, then I will repent of the good, wherewith I said I would benefit them. So here's the opposite. God first says, I'm going to, I'm going to pull down a nation, I'm going to destroy it. But if they repent, I'm not going to do what I said I was going to do. And here, I'm going to plant a nation. I'm going to bless them. But if they turn around and disobey me, then I am going to withhold the good that I said I would do to them. So that's different than I am the Lord, I change not. A declarative statement. This is a, a he's giving a, if this, then this, if this, then this. So God is giving a, a conditional uh, situation. Uh, we're not going to turn there, but think of the book of Jonah. You're familiar with the book of Jonah, right? Uh, Jonah didn't listen to God, ran to Tarshish, swallowed up by the whale, great big fish, whale, um, spit him out, went back, gave the message, and the message was repent. Forty days, uh, Jonah... Verse uh, chapter 3 says, 40 days, let's see if I can find it here. Uh, Yet 40 days and none of us shall be overthrown. Jonah was speaking God's message. God's message was, 40 days you're going to be overthrown. The people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. And the king caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor bird, beast nor herd nor flock taste anything. So they were going to fast, be covered with sackcloth, cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn everyone from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. And then this king says this, Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not. Jonah came with a, a announcement of judgment. Forty days, God is going to judge. Didn't say it was conditional, just made the statement. But as we read through it, we can tell it was conditional because 
They repented. And when they repented, God forgave them, didn't bring judgment. Consistent with God's character was that they repented and he did not bring the same evil that he had intended had they not repented. It, it, was, it was different. And so there was that, that's a, a picture kind of really of, of Jeremiah chapter 18 where here was a nation that God was going to destroy. He was going to pull it down. He was going to pluck it up, pull it down, destroy it. They repented. God changed his course of action based on their repentance. Uh, back to Exodus 32. Exodus chapter 32, where, where we were. Verse 12, Exodus 32, verse 12, the last part of the verse, Moses' prayer, turn from thy fierce wrath and repent of this evil against thy people. In other words, withhold judgment against thy people. Verse 14, and the Lord repented of the evil. He withheld the evil which he thought to do unto his people. What we have here is a conditional, God did not say, I'm going to destroy them no matter what. He didn't say that. He said, I'm going to destroy them. And we know from reading it through that it was conditional. If they repented or if something else happened and the something else was that Moses acted as a mediator on their behalf. Some, some suggest, and I'm not quite sure I agree with this, um, some commentators I read suggested that because Moses identified himself as part of the people and he confessed on their behalf, but you don't really see Moses confessing. You don't see him you, later on in the chapter. Uh, there's a reference to that, but he's asking God to withhold judgment. So here's, it, it was, God was going to do this. He wasn't pretending. He wasn't kidding. He wasn't making it up. Okay. Um, he meant what he said, but there was a condition that judgment would not come, and that was if a mediator, an intercessor, came in between. And it's interesting when you think of the people wanted Moses to be the mediator, and God was fine with Moses being the mediator, and so God really set up the mediator. God put the intercessor there, God had been working in the heart of the intercessor. Moses was, was a meek man. Moses was humble. Moses had compassion uh, and mercy. Uh, God knew how the intercessor would react. God knew before how Moses would react. And then God spared them because of the prayer of the intercessor, the, the mediator. And so it's, it's not, I, I mean, you can think of it as, I, I, rather than God changed his mind, God changed his course of action based on Moses praying. Had Moses not prayed, I believe God would have followed through. I, I, I mean, there's no reason not to think that. But God, it was conditional, and the condition was, you know, it wasn't, I'm absolutely going to do it. It wasn't a decree, and we know it wasn't a decree because God uh, changed his course of action uh, afterward. You think of this, here is sinful people deserving judgment, justly deserving judgment. God didn't, you know, it's not like God lost his temper. I mean, they were, they, it was 40 days since they had been scared to death of God. It was 40 days since they had said, you go talk to God for us because we're not even sure we're going to live anymore if we're in the presence of God. It was only 40 days 
since they themselves had heard God's own voice say, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image of anything that you have seen in heaven or in earth or under the earth. Uh, they, it had only been 40 days. They deserved God's judgment. And God sent a go-between. God sent an intercessor. God worked in the heart of that intercessor so that he prayed for them. And isn't that a picture of Christ? Mm-hmm. You know, I you, you think of just after Easter, I, I preached on the um, disciples on the road to Emmaus and how uh, Christ talked to them all along the way and they didn't know it was him. And he said, you know, Christ needed to suffer and he explained to them things in the scripture about himself. And, and then at the end of uh, Luke 24, uh, I think when he met with all the disciples minus Judas, of course, where he opened unto them the scriptures and explained different things to them. And I can't help but think he brought up this. You know, yeah, it's Moses, but it is really a picture of me being a go-between between between sinful people that deserve judgment and God. I was the go-between in there. And and that's that's who uh, Christ is. And so... um, not necessarily an easy thing to understand, but again, just to just to recap, uh, God does not say something and say, "Oh, I didn't mean it. Oh, I was just kidding. Oh, I I had good intentions, but I can't carry them out." You know, but there are times when God makes a warning that is conditional. Is that not true right now? Really, I mean, when you think of it, for the wages of sin is death. People without Christ are under the condemnation of God. God is not going to, when people get to heaven, oh, well, you've tried really hard. You know, there's no, there's no changing. But there is the opportunity for mercy before that. Our our doom is not sealed, so to speak, until we take our last breath without Christ. But if we have Christ, and you know, people, um, I'll I I don't do it often. I don't see him often. But Jehovah Witness, Mormon, knock on the door. Um, I will I I will have asked them this. I'm on the verge of dying. I am going to die before the day ends. What kind of assurance can you give me that I can get to heaven? And they can't. But you know what? God's word can't. Because that's where the thief on the cross was, right? He was at the 11th hour. He was at the 11th hour. And you know what? He was condemned. He was guilty. There was God's judgment was ready to come down, but he repented. And I, I think that's the, the picture that we have here is that it was a conditional warning and God had Moses there. God put Moses there. Uh, isn't it interesting? God didn't say, um, you know, verse 7, go get thee down. It's like, you know what? Do something. <laughs> uh, do something. You know, God didn't just wipe them out. Oh, here, Moses, here's what I did. God gave the intercessor an opportunity to intercede. Uh, We don't know. We don't know who God has us being an intercessor for. You know what I mean? Uh, We don't know who will be saved, but we do know people that we can pray for that aren't saved, that we can be uh, an intercessor on their behalf. We can be a prayer on their behalf. We don't know what the end will be. Sometimes we get the blessing of seeing people get saved. Uh, not always, of course, but God has us in the spot as an intercessor for certain people. And uh, we need to be doing what God wants us to do in that, uh, in that respect. Any questions? probably can't answer. Um, 
not not easy not easy things but uh, you know and then I didn't even open this part uh, God answers prayer how do you Amen. explain that just get you know and and I, I'll just say no I won't <clears throat> there's a thing called open theism that makes this I mean that's opens a whole different can of worms but you can look that up on your own so uh, any other questions all right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for uh, Jesus Christ being our go-between, mm. our mediator. Uh, the Bible says uh, there is one mediator between God and man, the man in Christ Jesus. And uh, we thank you that he not only pled for us, he bled for us. He died for us, uh, did much more than Moses did as an interceder. And uh, Lord, we, uh, we thank you that you loved us that much, that you came in the person of your son to die for us. And uh, Lord, I, I just pray that you would help us to see the opportunity we have and the responsibility that we have to be uh, interceders, to be mediators for others, and that we would pray on their behalf. Uh, we don't know the end uh, like you do, but we certainly know that you ask us to pray and you ask us to uh, witness and you ask us to warn. And so help us to be faithful in that. And uh, Lord, again, we just thank you for your word and that we can think on these things. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. Turn me off there, Art. Lower right. Mm -hmm.